Greetings, friends, and welcome to another episode of The Mistake Zone, your weekly dose of our lives and the mistakes within them. My name is Jaron Wade. Joining me, as always, one of my best friends in the whole wide world, Matt Alba. Hey, Matt. Yo. How are you doing? Yo, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Matt, Mm -hmm. that's great. Mm -hmm. We're here another week. Matt? Mm Mm-hmm. Might have the tummy from Lee's right Ooh. now, so we'll see how I'm doing tomorrow morning. But that's a tomorrow Jaren problem, mm-hmm. and tonight Jaren is ready to share some mistakes oh, because man. Matt, mm-hmm. I left the house last week. Ooh, congrats, man! Congrats. And you know, it was a big step for me. Mm-hmm. I ventured to the other side of town because Matt, mm-hmm. uh, my partner, and I, accompanied by a few of my partner's work friends as well. We went to Thursday Night Bingo, Matt. Oh, oh, okay. This was the first time I've played bingo outside of a school setting, mm-hmm. let alone one that has a cash buy-in with real cash prizes. <laughs> and for uh-huh. this being a Thursday evening, Matt, uh-huh. still a, I would say, a pretty decent turnout. Mm. I'm not sure what a decent bingo turnout is but i walked in a few minutes after the first round started just because matt traffic and construction not the greatest Mm -hmm. and i have to admit the clerks were really nice they totally saw me walk in look super confused at what was happening and you know ushered me to the clerk kiosk uh, they explained everything. Er, I bought my bingo stamper earlier from the dollar store, so I was prepared in that regard. Uh-huh. And, you know, I bought my $25 sheet and one another $25 sheet for my partner. Ooh, mm-hmm. So that gets you, I believe, six games. And then there are bonus intermission games, but yeah, those are extra buy-ins. But they were up front. They said, hey, you should really buy this now because... You might not be able to do the first one, but since this is your first time, you can explore. But if you wait any longer, the second game will start. And then, honestly, if you miss two games, that's probably not worth it. So, you know, Mm. you're reasonable in that regard. But Matt, my partner, was running late as well. So for the first, my very first game, I was juggling two, you know, nine by uh, three by threes. And Matt? Uh Uh-huh. That is too much bingo (laughs) for one man uh, who's doing this for the first time to keep track of. (laughs) Oh, man. And I know I was sitting with my partner's work friends, and she was just glancing over, (laughs) totally seeing I was missing numbers. Oh, no. Pointing out, hey, you have that one. Hey, you have that one. Oh, no. So, Matt, Mm -hmm. overall, you know, we've known each other for quite some time now. Yeah. And Matt, would this surprise you where there were a few games where maybe two rounds where, you know, I was running pretty close to getting a bingo Mm -hmm. and I was dreading, (laughs) hoping, praying that I wouldn't have to put my hand up for bingo because Matt, Mm -hmm. just the idea of going bingo, anxiety inducing. Oh man. Because Matt. Yeah. Shout out to one of my other and my partner's other work friend because she, not to put her on blast, Mm -hmm. she totally yelled bingo twice and those weren't bingos. Oh, no. Jared, okay. What is the rule for the bingo here? Is it like a line? Is it full card? Okay. Uh Uh-huh. So depending on the round, you have two chances to win. You have like the main prize and whoever gets the first bingo What I did like about it was, you know, you're not pressured to be the first one to immediately call bingo. Because once someone calls bingo, the the speaker or, you know, the ball jar will ask, okay, anyone else have a bingo here? So they'll open the floor and, you know, so no one's discouraged from having a late call. But as long as you answer, oh, I have a bingo during that check Mm -hmm. you know you'll be included in that pot which i thought was pretty good oh okay and as as long as you know the checkers are able to verify you but usually the way this bingo hall worked was every round you would have the main prize which would be hey 
first one to, or first people to get one line or first people to get two lines. Mm-hmm. And then you'd have the secondary prize would be like, okay, we're going to play until someone gets a full card or someone gets two lines or one round was first one to either get the inner square and then first one to get the X and then uh-huh. the remaining. So it was different patterns, which really confused me as well. Plus mm-hmm. I have to admit my partner did win a round but Matt, you know how they get you huh. is when you look at the round sheet, it will say, oh, if you win here, your pot is $2,000, for example. And we thought my partner won the $2,000 pot, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. she was only rewarded like one sixty. And it's one of those things where you only get the grand pot of that round if you get it within X amount of numbers. Ah, that's how they get you, Matt. That's how they get you. That's how they get you. But it was that mm-hmm. I would do bingo again. But I have to admit, when you again, you know me, we went, we, we rolled with a group of eight, mm-hmm. and everyone was pretty chitty chatty. Might have been shushed a few times, and I wanted to Ooh. die. <laughs> Jaren, Jaren, those are some serious bingoers. Yep, some serious big Matt. Mm-hmm. What's your experience with bingo, Jaren? I. Don't think I've like done a serious bingo in in like a long in in, in ever actually. I think okay. Like the last time I did bingo was like oh when we do it at work and I guess I was on like the caller side where I was just sending emails of um bingo numbers. Okay, that's pretty good, Matt. That's pretty good. Mm-hmm. And this is gonna sound super conceited, Matt, but. Mm-hmm. Walking in, I I had a feeling I had the itch, Matt, that night. That okay, at least. My partner or I, one of us is going to win tonight. Mm -hmm. But then it's that realization when we were leaving of, oh, this is just straight up gambling because only a hit, that was a pretty full room and only a handful of people walked out with money Mm -hmm. where none of my, or none of my partner's work friends walked out with anything. Matt, some of them actually hated the whole experience. Uh huh. I mean, bingo kind of plays itself, right? Like you can't. There isn't like a, a meta for bingo. I think it's all luck. Mm-hmm. It's all luck, and you paying attention, and the fact that they'll call anyone else have a bingo really, I feel like really alleviates some of that stress I initially feel with bingo of having to be the first one to call, mm-hmm. and it's also one of those things where. I don't know how I like this, Matt, but the ball, the caller will sometimes show the ball on screen mm-hmm. before he actually calls it. And you're not allowed to call bingo until he actually, you know, calls the number. And I, I think that's a little weird. Oh, OK. Uh, but mm-hmm. but that might be a hall thing for the for this particular hall. But Matt, mm-hmm. bingo. OK, especially when you win and you make your money back. Nice. But nice. Mm-hmm. If it's not for you, because Matt, this took three hours. Ooh. And that's a long time for bingo, Jaren. <laughs> That's a commitment. And not going to lie, there's also downtime just because if you don't buy into those extra rounds, you're kind of just sitting there mm-hmm. uh, debating if you want to buy an overpriced Dr. Pepper. Ooh. But Matt, that was my time with the bingo. Have to ask mm-hmm. anything non-mistake or, you know, mistake adjacent, but non, you know, video game or anime related happened to you this week. Jaren, everything in my life revolves around video games and or anime. <laughs> okay, fair enough, Matt. Uh-huh. Fair enough. Uh-huh. Where, Matt, I think we need to hit the anime quota for the week real quick. Mm-hmm. And not the Don Don or Don to Don this week, but Matt, mm-hmm. we went to, we found ourselves in a situation where we were able to see, you know, our favorite, Matt, a 4DX movie. Ooh. And we saw the new... My Hero movie, which I believe in the timeline really happens somewhere in between season six and seven, if I'm, or seven being the latest season, I believe. Mm-hmm. And at least for my partner and I, we watched everything up until we, we didn't start the new season yet. So this would still be in line with everything we knew what was going on and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So we went to My Hero Academia, You're Next, and Matt. Mm hmm. Hate to admit it, but I feel like the 4DX dream is dead unless this is Fast and the Furious. Because, Matt, Mm -hmm. I 
I don't know what it was. Maybe it's just because I had a stiff neck from poorly <laughs> sleeping uh-huh. and, you know, p- probably bracing the wrong muscles when working out recently. But Matt, mm-hmm. I feel like the whole time during all the seat movement, I was bracing my neck a lot more than I should have. And I don't know, it wasn't oh. a fun experience. But in terms of the the reason I say this should be a sweet treat for us for the Fast and Furious movie franchises mm-hmm. now, these tickets are still expensive even with the cineplex cine club you're still looking at a 20 dollars ticket and i feel like you know the 4dx experience as we've said before on the mistake zone is you're supposed to have all these different elements you know you're supposed to have the wind wit to correspond with wind on the screen of course the seats are more shaking uh more vigorously and aggressively than a D-Box per se. Mm -hmm. With any thunder or lightning, you'll have light flashes. But I feel like ever since maybe COVID, you don't get the water elements anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, I personally think the lightning flashes are kind of tacky. And you're only really going here for the vibrating seats. Like the roller coaster experience. Yeah. And I feel like now that my 4DX honeymoon period is over, it, I don't know, man, it, it's a really harder pill to swallow where it didn't mm. help that we totally noticed two guys just sneak in during the middle of the movie. Well, but in terms of my hero, uh, you're next, Matt, mm-hmm. this is your classic shonen in between season OVA because Matt stopped me if you've heard this before. Uh-huh. Super baddie who is exploiting a character to buff up him and his uh, like league of villains mm-hmm. uh, go up against, you know, our our tried and true heroes. Um and They separate the student heroes from all the adult teacher heroes. So it's up to the student heroes to figure out how to save the day, stop this big threat. And every, let's say, half an hour, you're hit with a, oh, that's an quote unquote Avengers moment of here's the reveal of people or a big ensemble just walking into the shot and to do their thing real quick. Mm -hmm. Where... I don't know what it is, but when you have a OVA, especially for something that has such a big ensemble of characters, Matt, I feel like each character is a really approaching fan service territory where at this point of My Hero, everyone has such thick plot armor. It's Mm -hmm. kind of the same thing I felt towards that end of Promise Neverland, where you have this big character, Dark Might, because surprise, he's inspired by All Might's iconic Yornax. Think he's talking about him. So Mm -hmm. he and his European mafia friends (laughs) kidnap this girl who amplifies their powers and, you know, is being shown to be this catastrophic threat. And yet, everyone Mm -hmm. has such high plot armor, the power of friendship. Uh, They defeat him and everything. It gets a bow tied up nicely where I I don't know about you, Matt, but I just don't take movies like this seriously, especially if you know this is slotted in between seasons where Mm -hmm. you expect all the plot moving you know, all the plot points that move the plot forward to happen in the season. Anything else is just like a side mission that ultimately doesn't matter. Yeah. It's, I don't know, it's entertaining, but at the same time, it's full of tropes you've come to expect from the series. You're seeing characters do one cool thing, and then it's on to the next character to do their cool thing, and on to the next mm-hmm, to do their mm-hmm. cool thing, where... Again, even though it's being presented of, oh, this guy is a Omega level threat, it doesn't actually matter. I don't know. Yeah, and it didn't help that my neck was stiff the whole time. So mm-hmm. if you're looking for a 
you know, just a fun side quest for the My Hero kids. You know, you can probably do worse, but at the same time, to pay, I don't know, $23 Canadian for the 4DX experience. Again, Matt, Mm -hmm. I feel like the 4DX experience, you would think this would be a slam dunk because it's an anime movie, but... I don't know. I feel like it doesn't go all the way. It's just a lot of aggressive shaking and like the occasional light flash where maybe when we saw, you know, Dragon Ball Superhero way, uh, you know, a year or two ago, you still had that new 4DX feel. So maybe if this is your first 4DX experience, uh, I would say save that for the next Fast and Furious. But Mm -hmm. if you are a My Hero fan, maybe check this out. But again, it's it's low stakes. At the end of the day, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but Matt, how do, how do you feel about OVAs that take place in between seasons? I mean, Jaron, to be honest, I think I maybe have a, a bad perspective on this okay. because I don't really watch OVAs for shonen that happen between seasons. Mm-hmm. So you know, I do I do understand the whole um, the story can't really move anywhere, and everything that happens in here is really inconsequential, yeah. but. Jaren, the kind of OVAs that I consume are, are slice of life OVAs, which, you know, they're basically just par for the course. Yeah. Where yeah. I know, you know, it's similar to when I talked about that Spy Family movie a few months ago, mm. where again, it ultimately doesn't add to anything, but that's it's a nice romp where I still feel like the stakes are low enough for it to be enjoyable but at the same time with my hero you're next it's when you're presenting this omega level threat and i know that this isn't going to be mentioned in season seven most likely then i don't know it it feels pointless in that regard where on the flip side if i'm watching something more slice of life adjacent oh this is just a slice of their life so i think Mm -hmm. i'm more forgiving in that regard but maybe it's it's just my relationship with Shonen at this point. Mm-hmm. I mean, Jerry, maybe it's just maybe it's just not the type of movie. Is there enough movement in there? Yeah, no, I would say there's like a lot of good movement. My mm. our chairs were shaking a lot. Plus, I do like the subtle ones where you do meet the side character on a motorcycle. So, oh, okay. Matt, I appreciate during the motorcycle riding scenes, especially when he's talking to Deku, and just your seat lightly vibrating. I thought that was <laughs> relaxing. Oh, Matt. Jaren, Jaren, where's the Sons of Caladon uh, 4DX experience? Okay, Matt. Mm-hmm. Say we had access to money mm-hmm. where, you know, no object. Uh-huh. Would you consider a 4DX setup for a action game as long as it was calibrated to it properly oh yeah jaren i've considered that in my like <laughs> current not not really having money life i have like deeply oh, considered man. investing in a six axis setup that'd be pretty for your six axis setup is it just full you know movement or can you set it up when i do jane's x <laughs> special move yes. uh fans <laughs> blow in my face oh man Jaren, I I don't I don't know exactly how it would work for something like ZZZ because I was really considering a lot more for like <laughs> racing games and mm-hmm. like I guess more particularly mech games. But fair, Jaren, I feel like you could still get a good experience uh, if you figure out how to set it up for uh, ZZZ. How far would you go for a racing and a mech game, Matt? Are you? Again, the question is strictly movement, or would you want fans, would you want spray bottles to Ooh. lightly pepper you with uh, water? I don't think I would want the water. I feel like that'd be a, a real like annoyance to clean, and I feel like I'd also kind of forget about the water one time, and then it'd sit for like six months, and then I'd go turn it on again, and I'd forget the water is oh. a thing, and it just gets sprayed with, with old water. That doesn't sound great, man. Mm-hmm. But the f- fans you would consider? Fans I would consider, yeah. I think fans would okay. be like a, an interesting uh, interesting ad. Oh, man. Now I'm, I'm just thinking of Forza Horizon for when it was in, you know, England and the snowy season and having that set up just make it Ooh. cold and me realizing how much I hate driving in the winter. Oh, man. But, yep. Mm-hmm. My Hero Academia, you're next. Could be a fun... It's a fun ride, but at the same time, it doesn't matter at that. But Matt, mm-hmm. 
I guess with a lot of our hobbies, it really doesn't matter at the end, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. some news came out last week in terms of a Microsoft partner program. And, you know, some quick Sony news here and there. So before we get to our main event of the episode, Matt, mm-hmm. was there anything from the Xbox Partner Showcase last week that caught your eye? I think there were maybe like three or four things that are like really caught my eye. Yeah. I think the first one that was like kind of a new new game to me is Eternal Strands. Um Matt? Mm-hmm. What is this game? Jaren, this looks like a, you know, kind of like a third person, uh, you know, magic game, kind of like in the same vein as I feel like I go to the kingdoms of Amalur well a lot when I'm trying to talk about games like this. That mm-hmm. It's kind of shocking how, again, if we were going to talk about the Mistake Zone and Saturday Morning Arcade Hall of Fame, mm-hmm. for some sick reason, Kingdoms of Amalur probably has. You know, not maybe not first ballot, but I feel like with our personal histories with that game, it probably finds a spot there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, honestly, I am so surprised that, like, that is such a thing that just lives in my head at all times yep but but yeah with internal strands uh physics magic system that yeah i don't know if it actually is a physics magic system but Mm -hmm. it looks like it is sort of like a physics sandbox with magic Mm -hmm. and that is enough of like an interesting looking thing to me to make me want to at least check it out that's fair matt and in turn something that caught my attention of Oh, that looks interesting. I want to check it out, Matt. Mm -hmm. Wheel World looks like, as you described, a open world cycling game with dungeons. The thing that I caught my attention was when they were scrolling through the different bike customizations, there was just a dude. (laughs) Uh This is that kind of after school cartoon network aesthetic that, you know, always resonates with me. And even though there seems to be, you know, racing elements, some dungeon elements, you know, bike customizations, there also just seems to be opportunities for you to ride around the world. And that, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm always looking for a good, you know, to put on a podcast, put on some music and just do the vibes because, uh, Biking on the street, IRL, scares me. Not not surprised, Mm -hmm. it scares me. Jared, the concept of riding a bike on the road terrifies me. Mm Matt, when I walk my dog on the daily, I'll see a biker uh, bike into the left turn lane and wait for the light to turn, and that gives me the tummy rumble. That is crazy, Jared. That's crazy. Matt, we also saw... I know this game has been floating around... Uh, for a minute now, but some more footage from Mouse PI for Hire. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people do describe this as that retro uh, cut-head, old-school cartoon, 30s cartoon aesthetic, but, you know, this is a first-person shooter, PvE game. Matt, Mm -hmm. how do you feel about it not necessarily going all the way as Cuphead did, where I did see a lot of people, you know, be excited for this game, but sort of ding the art style of, oh, the character and the enemies seem to be retro looking sprites, while the backgrounds mm-hmm. are just 3D backgrounds with cell shading. Uh, does that do anything for you positively or negatively? I mean, I really like the art style of this game, Jaren. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the kind of like, billboard sprite characters actually adds to the look instead of like taking it away i feel like if they were fully 3d it would be i think less visually appealing to me where as long as the characters um have that specific look honestly i don't like the backgrounds being the way that they are don't like i i don't think that's a negative per se Mm -hmm. so it's something i'm really looking forward to check out just because I do like a good first-person shooter experience. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Matt, anything else from the partner showcase to catch your attention? I mean, Jaren, I think um, I've talked about it on the show before, but Wu Chong Fallen Feathers had mm-hmm. another trailer here. Still looks good. Still looks uh, like Chinese girl Wukong, which I, I still need to finish. 
and I and think Game it's Pass, be on, correct? Yeah, I think it's going to be on Game Pass. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I, I think I saw that it, it, it was going to be on Game Pass. Okay. And Matt, mm-hmm. I believe it closed off with FBC Firebreak. Yes. A third-person co-op, I believe, horde shooter. And Matt, mm-hmm. I feel like the era of, you know, co-op, horde, either looter shooters, extraction shooters, um, you know, it, it's booming right now, Matt. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this one specifically, three-person co-op, Matt? Yes. How do you feel about three-player teams versus four-player teams for your gaming experiences? I mean, Jaren, for me personally, I kind of like it because, Jaren, getting four people together for, for a gaming session is is kind of hard. So, you know, reducing it by one is makes it, like, so much more easier. But sometimes it's just hard to get a pal together to, <laughs> Jaren, for that. It's so hard. A lot of my gaming experiences are single player. I feel that, Matt. Mm -hmm. I have to make up for the fact that all my friends live busy lives and roll my friends in gotchas. And that's okay Mm -hmm. because, Matt, Mm -hmm. every day I can hang, call three of them (laughs) to hang out in ZZZ. And even though we're doing the same thing and it's the same dialogue choices that I have to pick in order to maximize our trust level, Mm -hmm. still something, Matt. Still something. Oh man, Jaren. Sometimes when I when I want to, you know, just get that little bit more uh, relationship experience with the the people in ZZZ, I kind of just advance the days until I see them waiting somewhere. Fair, Matt. That's a good idea. Mm-hmm. That's a good idea. Um, but speaking about quickly going through gaming news, Matt mm-hmm. announced at New York Comic Con, which is also happening last week. Uh, Sony did announce that. Marvel Spider-Man 2 will be coming to PC next year on January 30th, 2025. Matt, mm-hmm. a lot sooner than I thought it would be. Yeah. Where yeah. they also kind of confirmed no other story DLC to come for um, the game. But, you know, those Insomnia leaks from, what was it earlier this year? Late last year? But... That might mean a Venom Miles Morales spinoff, but nothing confirmed in that regard. Uh, so, Matt, mm-hmm. Marvel Spider Man 2, is this something you're going to check out when it comes to PC this January? I think I will. Well, I don't think I'll check it out in January, but I think I will mm-hmm. be checking out uh, Miles Morales because I had a lot of All fun right. with the first Spider Man game that they bought to PC, and I never yeah. played the second one. Okay. So hopefully so, there isn't too much of a uh, story gap there. Okay. But Matt, mm-hmm. I think it was time for the quarterly, I guess, Matt. Mm-hmm. Steam Next Fests happen yes. a lot during the year. And surprise, another wave, I believe, concluded today, day of the recording. And, mm-hmm. you know, somehow we managed to pry ourselves from more Zone Zone Zero and Metaphor Re Fantasio mm-hmm. to check out some demos. And Matt, mm-hmm. I feel like my gaming tastes for uh, 2024 have solidified uh, and my the demos that I checked out for this go around Mm -hmm. make that really clear because Matt Mm -hmm. I think for me going into this round of Steam Next Fests Mm -hmm. uh, again we're playing Metaphor we're still playing ZZZ Uh, I wanted to see if the demos I checked out will not only pass the half hour mark but would make me want to stop playing in a positive manner because I don't want to spoil that full experience when it finally does come out. Mm -hmm. And for me, I started off with OMG words. And that? Uh Uh-huh. Stop me if you've heard this before. Okay. What if you took (laughs) Bellatro and replaced Uh poker with X? Because Matt? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, word replaces poker with Scrabble. And... Hmm. I'm I really dug the not only the first half hour I had of this game, Matt. I played this demo for I believe an hour fifteen overall, and I unfortunately lost at the final round of my run. 
And now this is what you would expect. This is, I guess, are, Matt, are we calling them Bellatro lights now? Because you run for, I believe it is 10 rounds. Mm-hmm. And then you each bet- in between each round, you have your the ability to buy different passives that are ever present. Or you can get different boons that when you play it will affect the board for potentially that round only. So mm-hmm. it is a lot of score manipulation. Even though you don't have jokers, you have board... Like, the board manipulation takes that place. So, Jaren... What's up? For, you know, when when you say, like, a Bellatro, like, I can understand yep. how that works for poker. But when I'm trying to imagine it on Scrabble... I'm kind of like drawing a blank on like how it gets modified. So you're modifying the board and your tiles where similar to Bellatro, Matt, you have a score that you want to hit Mm -hmm. uh, for every round and you only have five turns to hit said score. Yeah. And as you progress through your run, the score threshold becomes higher and higher. What I do appreciate is... Each round has three different score thresholds, a bronze, a silver, and a gold, Mm -hmm. where you want to hit the gold one to maximize your money so you can buy, you know, more passives or more boon modifiers. Because, Matt, Mm -hmm. what you're doing is, oh, I want, say I have this boon that lets me add another, oh, this tile on the board, you can either pick where a a triple score tile is or... A, rand- a triple score tile will be randomly placed there. You can place a money tile on your board. So mm-hmm. as the score threshold increases, you're trying to add more score modifiers on the board or you're trying to play boons that make, oh, this tile now is worth three times its you know initial score. Where I know with Scrabble... Sometimes it might be intimidating uh, just because your vocabulary is low and you might, you know, turn to a Scrabble dictionary where I think if you were to turn to a Scrabble dictionary for OMG words, I think that is still I don't consider that cheating just because not you need to really consider your passives and your boons to make sure you manipulate your board and your tiles enough to get those thresholds. So if you're looking up different words based on what you have, I I still think that's an asset rather than cheating. But that's just me Mm. because my vocabulary isn't the greatest. But uh, I don't know, Matt. I I really did like it. I really do like that you have three different levels. So you're still... It's not a pass-fail situation. It's a can I score enough just so I get the most money Mm -hmm. situation, Mm -hmm. which I do appreciate. But yeah, as a fan of Scrabble, I did like... Um, just this Bellatro take on it. So definitely something I'll be checking it out, I believe, early 2025. Uh, but Matt, mm-hmm. what was something you checked out this uh, Steam Next Fest? I mean, you know, kind of going off the Spider-Man thing, I uh, checked out a game called World of Unlit. Hmm. And honestly, this game is, is very, very... Um, <laughs> still needs a lot of work i think okay but the basic premise of this game is that it is a i feel like a speed running first person shooter and its gimmick is that you have a tether Um, Oh, okay and it is like you know kind of like going off spider-man it is the kind of tether where you it you know lets you swing through the world um the kind of levels that they demoed in here are all kind of like floating island type levels so, you know, you're doing a lot of jumping off the level and swinging underneath it, pulling yourself back up and, you know, going for whatever your targets are in that level. And, you know, there is like a time component to see how quickly you can do that. Um, okay. And I think it's very fun, but I do think that it is very, very rough. Um, hmm. There are some stuff where like uh, the tether at some points, I think, feels good 80% of the time but there's a 20% where it doesn't react the way you would want it to react or it feels kind of janky in terms of the physics that it's applying to you. Um, That's unfortunate. Yeah, but 
I don't know. I think there's a lot of stuff here that is is good but needs improving. Like, you know, it it doesn't have hit reactions. So, you know, if you're getting pegged by a like a gun from the side, you won't really know until it just like tells you that you die. But mm. since the levels are really only like a minute or two long, it doesn't really like, you know, feel bad to have to restart, but it is kind of annoying that you don't immediately know why you died or that you're even dying in the first place. Oh, um, yeah, that does sound pretty rough. Mm-hmm. Like, this this is very much, I think, in a very, very early state, and I really hope that this game, um, you know, gets a lot more work done on it in the future because I, I think there's a lot of potential in this game. Okay. where Does it have a release window, or is it still... No, to be announced at this point. I think it just says like 2025. Uh, okay. Oh, wait, no. It's being released in like two weeks. Oh. <laughs> this isn't a very rough state for it being released in two weeks. So I'm guessing it's going to launch in early access at this point. Maybe, yes. I I, okay. I would expect it to if that's uh, if it's its current state. But Jaren, yeah, like I think this uh, has a lot of uh, work to like go through. But hmm. maybe this is something we keep an eye on after it exits early access. Yes. Yeah, probably. But... Matt, Mm -hmm. uh, going back to my Bellatro light train, Yes. Mm -hmm. what if we replaced Bellatro poker with not Scrabble, but Plinko? Because Matt... Which game is Plinko? Matt, remember when we, you know, as a youth, you were sick and you watched uh, The Price is Right? Mm -hmm. And there was that game where you walk up the stairs to that wall and you drop the puck down the ah uh, yes, yes 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 mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. bullionaires is <laughs> your game to relive the excitement of watching someone drop that puck down the peg wall oh man because matt mm-hmm. stop me if you've heard this before <laughs> uh-huh. but you have x amount of rounds to <laughs> free each uh, score threshold and in between rounds you get different passives in the form of uh, plinko pegs or mm-hmm. wall pegs that will add different effects and bonuses to your random drop mm-hmm. and this mm-hmm. could be something like oh I want to add a cactus where if I don't hit this cactus during my run I'm going to get X amount of money or I'm going to put a teleporter near the bottom where if my uh, ball goes into the teleporter, it will teleport back to the top mm-hmm. and then go for a second round. So, again, this is something where I I mean, didn't really feel it the first time I played it, my first run, where I wasn't really seeing some of the synergies you want to do in terms of how you want to set up your board but you know i gave it a few more turns and that's when you know i got to see which ones run together or which pegs run together Mm -hmm. uh which mechanics potentially work together and what i do appreciate here is you know in between rounds you'll get one of three cards and you know you can of course re-roll them for a price but uh depending on what that card does on the bottom it will say hey this synergizes with some of your other choices that you've made where oh i'm going to put like food items around my board where if my ball hits it it's gonna kind of carry the food item with it Mm -hmm. and then if it gets to the end i'm gonna get x amount of dollars but if i pick this item like some sort of animal that will eat the food I'm going to get, you know, even bonus more money doing so. So I do like the kind of that UI approach of showing you what synergies are happening. But again, it's it's one of those games, Matt. Uh, I think this would be pretty fun in the future, especially just to see how the want to flesh it out with the different, you know, abilities and mechanics and passes. But I think between Billionaire and OMG Words, I think I have to give it to omg words as the one i'm looking forward uh to most of this genre but Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think in i I, in my sick brain i I love this genre Uh Uh it's a good genre it's a good genre i don't know there's something about them being so bite-sized uh 
and just those bite-sized uh, gaming experiences that I'm really liking. And both of them did work pretty well on the Steam Deck as well. So, mm-hmm. uh, Matt, mm-hmm. what else did you check out? I mean, Jaren, I guess speaking of a kind of, you know, bite-sized experience, Jaren, I played a lot of Survivors-type games. Yes. Um, and I think one that I want to talk about is Temtem Swarm. I saw this, Matt. Mm-hmm. I didn't check it out, though. So, yeah, Temtem Swarm is a Survivors-like game from the makers of Temtem, which is kind of like that more competitive style pokemon game and i think that in terms of production value this game is i think one of the better survivor likes that i've ever played i do like everything that they've brought in they seem to be bringing in some interesting um i guess stuff to the survivor genre it does still kind of have like you know your classic hey pick a character and then throughout the the game you can get you know your set amount of items your set amount of passive items and they're all just going to, you know, automatically work. The kind of interesting stuff that uh, the Temtem Swarm game is bringing is that, firstly, it seems like all the Temtem have their own move lists, I guess, for lack of a better word here, where, you know, they're, the items that they'll have available to them are set to, like, a certain group. I don't know if I fully like this or not, because it does kind of, I think minimize some of the build variety that exists mm. across like other survivor type games um but you know everything is kind of like built so that you have i guess like a bit more cohesiveness in the kit but you have like a smaller kit to work with compared to other survivor games okay of course it being a you know based on a monster game they have the ability for your character to evolve throughout the the game which i think is the way they're doing it is kind of weird because other than stats, I can't really tell the difference between the um, different forms where, you know, it, it is kind of like following that classic monster catching game, like thought process where, hey, you know, you start with your like stage one, you evolve it to the stage two and you go to their stage three. But when you are able to evolve them, it is taking the place of, or you, you're given the choice to evolve them at the same point when you would pick an item. And I don't like that you have to either evolve or pick an item. I feel like there wasn't a case where I would ever want to pick an item over evolving. And I feel like the evolving right. should just automatically happen once you get to that character level. Right. Another interesting thing that they're kind of bringing is that they're bringing kind of full passive trees to each character, which is um, a very interesting change. And I I kind of like it compared to, you know, the standard thing of, hey, we're just going to have like a very small tree where, you know, this character or all your characters now are going to have like increased pickup radius or increased damage or like, you know, stuff like that, where now they have a skill tree where it's a bit more unique to the character and it gives each character i think a little bit more investment so you have like more of a reason to like play as each of them okay is that something you prefer over i guess what has been for the most part standardized in the genre i i think it's interesting because i think this is the first game where i've ever seen something specifically like this Mm -hmm. um where, because there have been other games where, you know, they have just their trees, but they're kind of unlocked by doing stuff rather than, yeah. you know, investing your long-term currency into a singular character. Mm-hmm. So I'm interested in seeing, like, how I, I feel about this in the long run. Um, if I if I do even end up getting the, the full game, because, I don't know, I, I wonder how it would feel to you know, have a character that you invested a lot in and then go into a character that you, you know, haven't invested as much in and it being maybe feeling, like, notably weaker. And especially also, like, them having different kits. Seeing if, like, hey, if that adds a whole level of difference to, you know, character preference or not. Right. Yeah, I think it is ultimately how... 
how that investment feels and how that return mm-hmm. feels as well. Just mm-hmm. because, yeah, as cool as it sounds, I'm thinking about Hollow Creator and I'm thinking about Vampire Survivors. If I went all in on, let's say, a particular character, mm-hmm. I don't know. For me personally, you know, going to a different character is sort of like resetting a game. And I don't know if that really feels yeah right to me. Where mm-hmm. I do personally like the... Uh, like the choice at least to have a evergreen tree and be able to jump to a different character that might have a different appearance or a different kit if this is something like hollow cure but mm-hmm. I'm, I'm curious to see how temtem does handle that as well mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. same and i think like one new thing that um or at least new to me thing that i've seen in a temtem swarm is more relevant kind of like map events um, like there are these points like within the map where you are able to like kind of like just go to them and it is events, whether it's, Hey, now that you're here, we're going to increase the spawn rate or we're going to, you know, just spawn a bunch of experience or we've, we're going to like put like a boss on the field now, or, you know, kind of center stuff of like, Hey, here's like a chest for making it to this area. And I think like those are, that's like a change that I think I would like to see in more survivor likes where, you have more reason to, I guess, like, venture around the map. The only disadvantage here, I think, is that, like, I think with this system, their map is too big. And, oh, okay. It, like, I feel like I'm losing a lot by going for these events because, you know, when you're moving into, like, a different direction, you're kind of also abandoning all the experience drops. And it, right. I don't know, like, that feels kind of bad. And I, I'm wondering if, like, they're kind of just going for a... You know, you pick one or the other type thing that you want to do. But I don't know. I, I feel like I, I wish I could invest or, you know, interact more with the events without losing or feeling like I'm losing so much by not leveling up. Do you um, need to put more magnets at that point? Then? More magnets, yes. I, my, I would want more In my magnets. opinion. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Something to let you bank all that XP at once. Mm-hmm, where mm-hmm. I'm the same way, Matt, mm-hmm. where especially with the latest vampire survivor we'll, we'll kind of get into that i know the castlevania dlc was also announced today oh, yes. so mm-hmm. when that comes out i can maybe we'll do a check-in with vampire survivors because matt mm-hmm. how i play vampire survivors now compared to how i did when it's when i started with it is it's such a it's a weird game now where as much as i adore vampire survivors once you figure out how to break the game, it becomes more so a nuisance than a spectacle. But we can get into that a little later. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. But Matt, mm-hmm. in terms of Steam Next Fest for me, mm-hmm. uh, gotta mention one more game within this realm, and that is Three King or Nine Kings. Sorry. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Matt. Hmm. Stop me if you've heard this before. Mm -hmm. You have a number of rounds that you need to get through. And in between each round, you'll get one of three choices that you can pick to help strengthen your run. Mm -hmm. Where with Nine Kings, the premise is you start as a king and you have to fight three other kings during your run. And Mm -hmm. I believe after 25 rounds or so you'll complete a run and then you're the super king at that point Uh um the gameplay breakdown is your kingdom consists of a three by three grid where your main castle is in the middle and then you have eight squares surrounding it and then Mm -hmm. you uh in between rounds you'll get three cards which correspond to either buildings and units and each turn you pick one of those cards to place within one of those eight squares and that could be something like hey i want to hire a bunch of knights or i want to hire a bunch of archers or i want to get a forest that buffs any characters adjacent to it like or i want a archery range which gives attack speed to any units adjacent to it as well where Mm -hmm. you're kind of trying to build your army and in between each rounds you send them off and they fight 
you know, an opposing army. And yeah. as long as you wipe out everyone and at least you have one surviving unit, then you're on to the next round, you know, your units refresh. And then it's that's kind of your gameplay loop. And mm-hmm. with your castle being in the middle, that serves as a, I guess, a bonus attack per se, where depending on your class, you can click to do a ranged attack from your castle and that will damage whatever you click on. But of course, that's on a cooldown. And depending on what kingdom or class you pick, that um, radius will be either big with a slower cooldown or small with a faster cooldown. And of course, you can pick cards to buff that if that's how you want to play as well. Mm-hmm. Where I think it's a... Matt, I think 125... Uh, round run took me like seven to ten minutes so you know short burst easily i think accessible but it's one of those the first few difficulty levels are pretty easy and it is only when you kind of get to the higher ones especially when you unlock different deck or king archetypes that's where you know who you draft what facilities you draft as well your placement will really help you with your battles just because I think in the beginning you can really brute force it with a bunch of you know mercenaries and uh facilities that buff them but say you when you unlock the spell class those wizards are pretty squishy and if you don't Mm -hmm. have your dps up you're going to be wiped real quick oh so it's it's one of those games, Matt, uh, but I do like it, how more bite-sized in it. I don't typically like fantasy settings, but I feel like uh, it has a good, you know, aesthetic to it, where this is definitely something I'll check out next year when it fully releases. Mm-hmm. But Matt, mm-hmm. that's all my, you know, Velastro adjacent lights <laughs> right now. Uh, anything else you checked out this Steam Next Fest? I mean... There's this weird game that I, I played called uh, Building Relationships, Jaren. Okay. And, Jaren, this is a, I want to say, a physics sandbox dating sim. Um, mm. Kind of like, you know, kind of plays in that same realm as, like, Goat Simulator. But it is, I think, attaching a, not a real dating sim, but, like, a, a jokey dating sim into it. Um, okay. The main gimmick is, um, you know, of course, it being called building relationships. You are physical buildings, and you're just, you know, matchmaking with each other. That mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. isn't there? It's this isn't that other dating anything game, right? No, no, no. This isn't the this isn't the game with text box, Ken. <laughs> This is okay, okay, okay. This is like a low poly, almost N sixty four looking um, game where you are playing as. I think it's like a, you're playing as like a two bedroom, like or no, like a bachelor pad. Actually, it's like a one bedroom bachelor pad. <laughs> That's a good goof. That's a good That's goof. actually a really good goof. <laughs> and you know, you're able to kind of just roll around. Kind of, it it controls badly, not badly, but it controls in that same clunky way that you would control. It feels like to control like the Katamari in Katamari Damacy, hmm. where it's like a okay. little awkwardly shaped. You know, it's not round, it's cubic, so you're kind of, like, bouncing around. And the main conceit of the game is kind of, like, going around this island, basically hitting on other buildings and collecting. It just It's basically also just, like, a platforming collect-a-thon. Okay. Jaren, I, I think if there are people out there who kind of like the physics sandboxiness and kind of just, like, the create your own fun-ish aspect of, you know, games like Goat Simulator. I think this might be a game that's worth checking out. I think the dialogue is a good level of corny campiness that I, I really like, and uh, I'm interested in seeing where this uh, game is going to land in the future. Okay. this You actually sold me on this. I think this sounds like a good meme game. Mm-hmm. Where, Matt, mm-hmm. speaking about cart. I guess you would say uh, building relationships has that cartoon aesthetic to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I checked out another game that also has that cartoon network, you know, after school energy, and that's Sulfur. And that this mm-hmm. is a, I guess it's 
a extraction shooter adjacent first person shooter uh, that has a particular art style where it seems really familiar, but at the same time, I couldn't tell you what the actual art style is, where it does just remind me of a after school uh, cartoon network cartoon. But I really do like the premise in that you play as a pastor, a priest of this church. It's essentially a church that, you know, lets anyone in, uh, anyone just seeking a place to belong, seeking forgiveness. That's kind of the backstory where mm-hmm. the issue in doing that is you kind of invite some unsavory people, including a witch who in turn burns down said church and flees off into this magical cave. And you and your, you know, church attenders are now in essentially purgatory or sulfur. And Ah. your goal is to traverse these magical caves to find the witch, seek revenge, and hopefully turn back time to get you to, you know, undo her essentially killing you and your uh, churchgoers. Mm -hmm. So Matt, this is a, you run into a cave. Uh, So far it does have that, you know, medieval fantasy village aesthetic to it so you know so far everything i fought is goblin looking creatures Mm -hmm. uh, cartoony goblin creatures but yeah first person shooter with like a lot of different mechanics so it's everything you would expect with this aesthetic mat right you have enchantments you have spells but you also have guns and you're kind of balancing finding armor finding um ammo finding different enchantments and, you know, upgrading your gear and upgrading your weapons uh, all while jumping through different portals. But Mm -hmm. at the same time, Matt, it's at any time you can leave your run uh, and, you know, keep your items. But surprise, if you die, you lose everything Uh and have to uh start anew. Where, Matt, Mm -hmm. I'm really bad at pushing my limits (laughs) and I'll end up dying where... I think despite its, you know, cartoony nature, it's a lot easier to die than Mm -hmm. I thought Mm -hmm. it would be, especially for those early uh, levels. So did find myself, you know, playing more loosey-goosey as opposed to playing a bit more conservatively, especially when I have, oh, I have some new boots that I would like to hold on to or you know, some enchantments that I want to use later. But all it takes is one archer you don't pay attention to and Mm. you're done so mad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But again, like the aesthetic, like its run-based nature, uh, definitely something I'll check out when it releases, I believe, next year. But Yeah, it looks like very interesting. Like, Jaren, how scarce is the ammo in this this game? To be fair, fair i during my runs maybe this speaks to how bad i am in the games Uh i never ran out of ammo for my primary weapon yeah Yeah. because like the guns in this game or at least like you know watching through the the trailers for this game the guns look very borderlandsy almost in terms of Mm -hmm. like what they're doing and i feel like it would be a shame to like have that limited by uh ammo count to be fair, I like some of your church goers. You can find and like other NPCs you'll find in the caves, and they'll be mm-hmm. ready to sell you stuff as well. Ah, I see. So a lot of the times they do have ammo uh, for weapons. I don't have. Uh, ah, mm-hmm. I, I was using a pistol for the most part, just because Matt. Every time I found something new, mm-hmm. died, lose that item. Classic. So mm-hmm. uh, it's all, all about really, you know, it's your risk versus reward. But Matt mm-hmm. always push those risks way too high Mm -hmm. but yeah really do like the look of sulfur do you want to check it out do like the story wrapper behind it as well Mm -hmm. uh that Mm -hmm. what else did you check out jaren i think this is maybe the conceptually weirdest game that i i have on my uh list it's Mm -hmm. called kkckc which stands for keyboard key character keycap and Yes, those are words. (laughs) Those are words. But in essence, this is kind of um, a platforming, side-scrolling, like, shooter game. I don't really know, like, how to describe it. But it is roguelike in nature where, you know, 
you do a round and then you pick one of three upgrades and then you know you go on to the next round you know so on and so forth until you eventually i'm assuming there's an end jaren i haven't been able to make it because mm-hmm. jaren this game is so hard for me to control but i think it's so interesting because right. the main i guess like gimmick of this game is its control scheme which is um you know based on the words that i said that comprise this title um i think it like makes sense to say hey you are playing as a like keyboard keycap and the limits of the play area like the background of it is basically just a keyboard um it goes from like you know the tilde and left control all the way to backspace and right control and you are controlling this keycap with the kind of like very oddly to me or oddly at first uh the arrow keys on your keyboard because you know they're going to be enemies and stuff like flying around coming across the screen and whatnot and the way that you aim is by hitting the equivalent keyboard key to hit the enemy wherever they are on like hmm. the keyboard background and oh, that sounds weird mm-hmm. like it's not you don't have to be like totally exact like let's say you're you know in the area of the right control if you press left control you just kind of shoot in that direction um so your keyboard control is kind of just like more so saying what direction you're going to be shooting from um the more like i guess like pro way to do it is that if you hit the key that the enemy is actually on you do like double damage to them mm-hmm. but i don't know the concept of like aiming in this way is like very interesting to me and i don't know this gimmick is is really working on me it make it's it makes me like really want to get used to this in some way i i feel like i want a way to control this that isn't the you know keyboard buttons like i wish there was maybe like some way to play with both of the hands on the main portion of the keyboard but i don't know this this is this gimmick is like interesting enough for me to to kind of like stay interested in this game okay man that i don't know that's just super confusing to me oh yeah it definitely is super confusing i think having to do movement with my right hand is so foreign to me now and then mm-hmm. you know not having this weird aiming system is is not helping but it it is you know it interests me in that same way that like quap interested me right yeah the way you were describing it that's the first thing i immediately thought of as mm-hmm. well mm-hmm. i think matt for me during the steam next fest something that was really interesting to me again you know me matt i'm all mm-hmm. about that aesthetic i'm all about those vibes and mm-hmm. I think keep driving is what has my vibes of the Steam Next Fest, uh, let's say October 2024, Mm -hmm. where before I start with what keep driving is, Matt, Mm -hmm. this is something that I hope they fix for launch because when I booted up the demo for keep driving, it started in, let's say, a 900 by 500 screen. Uh, our window uh-huh. and the mouse is in the top left corner uh, and the menu you know to pick new game options continue is on the bottom middle yeah so obviously i'm gonna move my mouse to click new game yeah but it's one of those things where i move the mouse and it immediately goes off window and it turns into my desktop cursor uh. where the moment I scroll back, oh no, my mouse is again in the top left corner of the screen. Ah, I see. And I see. it's yeah, yeah. one of those things where I, you know, controller did nothing, arrow keys did nothing, where I had to force it to go into, you know, uh, force it to go into windowed mode so I would be able to actually properly put it to full screen. But mm-hmm. uh, with that aside, not, this is something that I was pleasantly surprised with because keep driving is Matt. Mm-hmm. stop me if you've heard this before uh-huh. but 
your goal is to essentially do a road trip to visit your friend at the other end of the map. Mm -hmm. And you're essentially driving from town to town uh, along the way. You pick which town you want to hit, and those are essentially your rounds. And during each round, it's you essentially driving uh, toward... It it drives automatically from a side-scrolling view, and essentially your HUD looks like your you know front seat your front dash uh you have a rear view mirror at the top of the screen you have essentially your radio in the middle you have a gas pedal and a brake pedal the brake pedal essentially if you press that's your pause menu Uh and Mm -hmm. with your gas pedal that's i want to skip this event or this encounter because matt Mm -hmm. Essentially, there's a battle system in Keep Driving. Uh, Again, this has, you know, late 80s, early 90s energy to it. Uh, Nice pixelated graphics. But, uh, Matt, during Mm. your time on the road, you'll run into a threat. And during the tutorial, your threat is, oh, I'm stuck behind a tractor. And each threat has these different attacks which correspond to your status which is oh Uh um if it attacks me it might hit my energy level my gas my car durability oh i see okay so matt Mm -hmm. this is going to be hard to uh, but stay with me Mm -hmm. um picture a line a straight line for example and in this straight line you'll have let's say a dozen different icons where it the pattern might be blue, orange, green, blue, blue, orange. And let's say blue is your car durability, green is your energy level, and orange is your gas level. And that's essentially your opponent's attack for that turn, where it's going to hit you for those uh, statuses when it's their opponent's turn. Mm-hmm. So for your turn you have different skills that are hanging on your rear view mirror. And they essentially have different um, statuses on them. Like, oh, this has a pattern of, let's say, blue, green, or green, space, orange. And essentially what you want to do is take that skill Mm -hmm. and overlap it to its corresponding enemy attack. Yeah. And if you perfectly overlap it, you'll do a perfect hit and you'll get an extra turn to use another skill to kind of overlap. So you're essentially using your skill to overlap mm-hmm. and nullify your opponent's attacks. That's an interesting system. And it, it's a cool system. And, you know, some skills have energy costs, some have limited uses. You can have items that are like, oh, this duct tape that I keep in my uh, glove compartment will help me, you know, fight against durability attacks, for example. So Mm -hmm. it's a lot of, it's a unique system, but at the same time, you'll also get these different events on the road of moments of introspection of, oh, my back's getting tight. What do I do? Do I stop here to stretch (laughs) Uh or do I, you know, power through it for, you know, additional you know, penalties to my energy level or my gas level. Mm -hmm. And um, surprise, Matt, you can pick up hitchhikers uh, who, (laughs) if you do so, turn into party members with their own skills that you can use in battle. And then you can also have different conversations with them as you drop them off in the various towns in between. So I don't know, Matt, it's a really unique game. A lot of managing resources, uh, you know, managing ailments. And even though it's supposed to be this nice, you know, vibes game, you know, killer soundtrack as well, not just managing all those ailments resources kind of gets mm-hmm. a bit stressful. Uh, not to mention there is a inventory management system of, okay, I have, you know, my back seat and I have my trunk. What am I going to bring with me what items am i going to pick oh this hitchhiker has a guitar how can i rearrange my trunk so his guitar fits in Mm. for example Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you know in the start of the game you can pick a backstory you have your starter package whether it be oh 
I want to bring video games to my friend on the other side of the map. So uh-huh. now I have video games in my car and stuff like that. So yeah, mm-hmm. keep driving. It's really unique experience. Really cool aesthetic. Take a shot for all our fans out there every time I said aesthetic for <laughs> this episode. But yeah, definitely something I'll be keeping an eye on. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. Uh, Matt, anything mm-hmm. else you you had your eyes on during Steam Decks Fest? Jaren, I think I'm going to bring um, a weird game because I don't know if this is really a game. Okay. Jaren, I played um, an experience <laughs> called Poly Lily Lee Rhythm. And no, those are also, those are syllables. Those are syllables. <laughs> but, you know, it, it it is just like, you know, the word polyrhythm, but like with more LYs thrown in there for flavor. And okay. Jaren, this game hurts my head. Um, mm. because this is, you know, kind of like a, this is a rhythm game, but it is, I think in the most literal sense, a rhythm game, mm. because this is about keeping multiple rhythms going on at once, you know, as, and, you know, that's why it's called like poly lily rhythm. And I think, you know, trying to play this game made me realize why I was so bad at drums in a uh, rock band. Right, because what's basically happening in this game is that um, you know, instead of having your standard note chart, you have shapes, and on these shapes, there's kind of just like a light that, a ball of light that goes back and forth. For example, there's like a line, and just a straight line, and the ball of light goes from the top to the bottom, and when it hits the top, you press the button. When it hits the bottom, you press the button, um, and then equivalently, there will be a triangle. And, you know, once it hits every corner, you have to hit the button. And, you know, they are all, the balls of light are all moving at basically the same speed. But you have to keep multiple rhythms going across multiple hands or fingers, um, like however you're, you're, you're using to, like, play this game. That my head hurts. Yeah. Jaren, this is wild. I feel like people who are, you know, really into actual rhythm like actual drummers would probably have a real kick like get a real kick out of this game because you know while it's like easy enough to keep like hey this one's going on twos this one's going on like it's a square so it's going on fours so you know you're just hitting you're keeping beat with uh, the fours and then you're hitting the two every other time right but then when you get into like the weird stuff of like okay here's one button is going on twos, one button is going on fives, and one button's going on sevens. Nope, nope, yeah. nope. Backing up, man. <laughs> Jaren, I think this is such an interesting experience to go through in trying to keep rhythm. And I don't know, I think it's a, a that and that's what I was saying. Like I there isn't really much of a, you know, scoring thing going on here. Like it does have your kind of standard you know, good, perfect, great, bad, miss kind of thing going on. But I think it's more so about the experience of keeping multiple, I guess, like, beat timings going at once. And, I don't know, it, it is an interesting experience that I think is very much worth checking out. Yeah, I feel like that will be, just because my TikTok algo serves me a lot of different, you know, producer tips and... Uh, kind of exercises where mm-hmm. it's hey do you know a four beat with your right hand do a two beat on your left like something mm-hmm. similar mm-hmm. to that mm-hmm. so i feel like this is within that realm that can really you know less of a, as you said less of game more of a kind of rhythm tool which has its own does sound really interesting to me but also terrifies me yeah. at the same time that mm-hmm. that's definitely something i want to look into but it also terrifies me mm-hmm. jared i honestly think just like go pick up the demo because like it has i think i didn't get past three <laughs> rhythms at once because i just couldn't keep it up jared i could barely keep up the two rhythms when the two rhythms got weird <laughs> but oh man that's I, rough yeah that sounds I, think, rough. I think the demo is definitely worth checking out if um keeping keeping time is uh interesting for you all right well, Matt, mm-hmm. for the last game I checked out for this uh, season of Steam Next Fest, mm-hmm. is 
I believe it's something you also checked out. Yes. And Matt, Mm -hmm. this is Bloodshed, which is a boomer shooter survivor game. Mm -hmm. And Matt, Mm -hmm. as someone who enjoys boomer shooters, as someone who enjoys, you know, survivor light games, Mm -hmm. I think with a lot of the different Steam Next Fest demos, a lot of them do ask for your feedback in the form of surveys, you know, just go to the discussion board, share your experiences with it. Where I think this is the only one I really put in some time for the survey. Because Mm. Matt, Mm. definitely, I I thought this was a good demo. I'm really glad I was able to try it. Uh, I'm looking forward to the official release. But at the same time, there's some things that aren't fully there for me where yeah. I think it in merging boomer shooters with survivor lights, I think it misses the highs of both genres. And I think that might be something they're able to fine tune, but mm-hmm. at its current state, uh, it's Matt. I think mm-hmm. with the vampire survivors, my goal is get it to a, a AFK state as fast as possible. And yes. that's how I enjoy Vampire Survivors. Mm-hmm. I feel like with Bloodshed, I'm building towards that, but it's not for enjoyment purposes, if that makes sense. It's, uh, mm-hmm. I wish I was doing more in this game than I actually was in the demo, where Matt... Mm-hmm. You do have objectives when you do your runs, but you only see those in before you start. And I do wish the objectives were somewhere in the pause menu. But, oh, I didn't even you know, notice these objectives. Yeah, there are some objectives mm-hmm. as well. But, you know, this is a survivor's like, you know, you have 20 rounds, you level up, you pick upgrades for, you know, your weapons. And that... Mm-hmm. I wish there was more enemies that spawned because, you know, you can set it to manually firing or automatically firing. I just felt like there was never enough enemies to make it feel like a spectacle. Uh, I also uh, wish that there was a final boss at the end, like to cap off the, yes, the run. Yes, yes. Where I feel like uh, Wave 20 just ended and it just felt really anticlimactic. I wish there was more elite enemies because, again, the enemy variety isn't quite there. And it's all just filler enemies where I think it this leans more into the survivor genre, I guess. But maybe I want more kind of boomer shooter elements to make it a bit more engaging. And maybe I'm playing it for the wrong reasons but Mm. you know that's how i felt playing through the game where i also wish there were more visual indicators for where you know elite enemy spawns or where there's chests in the field you know something similar to vampire survivors to help guide me to where to go and that Mm -hmm. more importantly I, i kind of wish there were like optional objectives uh that randomly spawn during the round to make it more engaging you know like kill a boss get certain weapon kills, maybe to force you to switch weapons, you know, cap an area, destroy spawned objects, you know, stuff like that. Something to Mm -hmm. do because for the most part, I just found myself running around in a circle, collecting orbs, automatically shooting things. And I got, and then at one point I just backed against a wall and then alt tab. And then I I was, you know, yeah, I was done with that round where I feel like XP is also it slows down after level 12, 13, which also adds to the kind of the downtime. But mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think my my biggest quote unquote issue is the weapons, Matt, because yeah. it, it, it's a twofold where, you know, you do have this Diablo adjacent aesthetic, but you're using pretty basic, you know, you're using a sawed off shotgun, AK 47, uh, these pretty typical weapons you would expect. Yeah. And there's just nothing really interesting about them Mm -hmm. where I kind of wish it was more flashy, more unique. And even though you have different skills, 
Um, again, it lacks that flashy pizzazz that I was looking forward to, where everything just felt so muted. Everything felt mm-hmm. kind of slow. And I think the biggest issue for me, Matt, was, you know, with these games, Vampire Survivors being, you know, the front runner, you pick all these different weapons and everything's running at the same time where Mm -hmm. you only have one weapon active at a time. And I had, again, you have no incentive to switch weapons, especially if you build towards one weapon in the beginning. Like you're not going to switch to a weaker weapon. Mm -hmm. And there are melee weapons and that, that melee weapon is so unsatisfying. Yeah. No impact at all. Like, I honestly just stuck to each character's default weapon and never switched. Where I know I was browsing through the locked characters that will be available in the full game. And, you know, you have some uh, magic-based ones where I'm hoping they get a lot more flashy. But just at the same time, I feel like I see potential there. But it's it's just not quite there for me. Where I want it to be more engaging rather than... Kind of, it, it's just kind of boring by mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. 10 minute mark but again potential is there for me but Matt what did you think of Bloodshot? I mean Karen I think I I'm going to be echoing a lot of your thoughts on uh, Bloodshot mm-hmm. like I think to like sum up my experience with Bloodshot I think it is a very good base template that doesn't do anything too interesting with it right um like, yeah, I, I did hit the point where, hey, you know, I can just, like, walk into this house and aim at the door with the shotgun and nothing is going to hit me. Uh, you know, just yep. leaving auto shot on. Um, that is also when I realized that it seems like if an enemy can't see you, it won't pathfind to you. Yeah. Um, unless it's within a certain distance of you, which is kind of unfortunate. Uh, so, and that really takes away the kind of swarmy nature of the game. But I think, like, you have to make that concession or I think this game is, like, very much missing indicators on where where everything is. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like I was always worried about getting swarmed from behind, but that was never actually happening. And yeah. I would want, like, a radar or something equivalent to, like, get an idea of what's behind me because I feel like, you know, the swarminess is, I think, what makes a survivors like game interesting because you want to survive uh-huh right? uh-huh and i also think that yeah like you were saying the guns are very like normal like they do what you expect um i really hope that in a future update or something they you know you said they mentioned you mentioned that there's going to be magic i didn't actually look into any of the extra characters but uh that sounds like it could be well to be fair i mm-hmm. i hope that they they have magic like they look like sorcerers and witches and the witch characters see. but for all i know maybe they don't have actual mm. spells but you know you do have skills with like a homing spell a bear yes. trap lightning strikes see, but that's actually my issue yeah. with the skills in this game um which is that they are all dps based Mm -hmm. i wish that there was something that added utility whether it is to your skills or to your guns where you know it's like stuff like oh you got life leech and like oh that's like a melee weapon exclusive type thing you know incentivize using the melee weapons or you know something that hey cool down on hit or slow on hit or you know thorns or you know something to add build variety to yeah, to the characters. It's something that I, I feel like this game is really, really lacking. Yeah, because right now the upgrades to your weapons aren't anything special. Nothing like really out there. It is. Mm-hmm. It's just numbers remember, go up, just, basically. Yeah, just yeah. numbers go up. Maybe more ammo, maybe faster reload. I'm not sure. But yeah, again, like you said, good foundation where I'm, I'm really rooting for this game Matt, because I do like mm-hmm. it. I just wish that there was something more to it where... I'm definitely going to keep an eye out just to see how they take the feedback that they get. But who knows? Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm just an outlier and people like what this is. So, you know, rooting for the game. Hopefully uh, excited to see how it unfolds. But that that was everything on my end. Uh, Any Mm -hmm. other titles that you checked out? There's two that I 
<laughs> want to check out, but I'm gonna go through them really quickly because they're, they're kind of like bummer notes. <laughs> oh no! Okay, but Jaren, um, there's a game called Starduster, which I think is a uh, very interesting rhythm game. The way that this game plays is basically that you control a kind of like this. It's like a circle with a chunk missing from it, so it's basically like a C. Um, it takes place kind of in space, and the objective is like you know you open. On that opening, you take in these kind of like um, notes, which are kind of which are yellow, and then you want to hit these purple notes that come at you with the non-open parts. So you're kind of like shielding. And I like the system. The system works very well, but there's like two major drawbacks here. The first is that mm. um, the notes and the I think they're like ships and they're asteroids. So the ships that are coming in and the asteroids that are coming in, you know, they're coming from basically outside the screen towards the middle where uh, your basically cursor thing is. And that's mostly fine. The issue is that when it comes from the bottom or the top, what a lot of these screens are or I'm playing it on like kind of like a, you know, a 16 by 9 like uh, window and you have less time to react on anything that's coming from the top or bottom which makes it um, kind of annoying to, like, deal with. Yeah. And the part where that really falls apart for me, Jaren, is that this is a no-fail type game or no-miss oh, type no. game where once you right, miss, right. it starts over from the beginning. Um, and I really don't like that for a rhythm game, especially one that yeah. doesn't randomize uh, because it is, like, a kind of, like, set path that's coming to you. And, you know, once you miss once, it's... Kind of a, okay, you're just going to be redoing the same thing. Um, right. I think I would have a lot more fun with this game if it was scoring you more so instead of uh, having a one miss you're out type thing, especially since the tracks are kind of long. Um, they seem to be like two or three minute tracks, and I think that's too long for a one miss and you're dead type thing. Yeah, that's uh, that. Mm-hmm. Y- you know, I mean, whenever you mention rhythm games, I'll listen. But mm-hmm. yeah, I feel that that's too brutal for me. Yeah, who wants a more casual rhythm experience? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I kind of like would like more a more casual experience out of this because I do like the core gameplay of it, and it is like visually appealing to me because it is like a very simple looking graphic system um, that is like staying a little flashy. So I I kind of hope that like this game introduces that sort of change in the future. Mm-hmm. But the other game that I'm going to be kind of on a bummer about is a game that I was really looking forward to, but I think is just not a game for me. And Jaren, this game is Rift of the Necro Dancer. Oh no, Matt. Jaren, I, I think I'm just too ingrained <laughs> in... Uh, standard note highways to play this game. Right. Because, you know, I I like the uh, Necro Dancer property. Like, I think the aesthetic of this game is actually so, so good. It looks very nice. I love the... Jaren, I love when games or rhythm games do the here's a level to do calibration instead of like, hey, here's just like, you know, a thing that goes across screen, press the thing when you hear the sound or, you know, press the thing when it crosses the the line yeah but this game in terms of like you know base gameplay of a rhythm game it doesn't bring anything new the Mm -hmm. place where it innovates is the note highway and i hate it (laughs) okay because Because it's not traditional right it's not traditional and i can't i i just can't wrap my head around reading it properly because okay. the way it works is that, like, you know, it is just on a North Highway where uh, monsters are going to come from, you know, the top of the North Highway towards you. And, you know, you attack them when they enter the the area where like, you have to hit the button. Um, the buttons are, you know, just like your up, left, and right arrows. And you can press down to hit all three of those things at once. The trick here is that since the monsters are the notes... They interact differently with the um, with the, I guess the hit area. So you have slimes, which are you know, they're normal. They they act how you would expect a North Highway to work. Where once they get to there, you you hit the button and then like you 
confirm them and they they die and you know it counts as you're perfect or good or whatever. Um, but then you have things like, hey, this slime is blue. So when you hit it on the the note or the like the area where you hit things, it bounces up one bar and then it'll come back down again. So it's basically just like you know, just two back to back notes, but it doesn't immediately read that way. Right, right. I feel like this is a lot more reactionary than I, I kind of want out of a rhythm game. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like you know, there are um, similarly there's like skeletons where when you hit them, it pushes them backwards until they hit another note, and then they'll start coming back down. So it's kind of like a delayed one two. Um. And for the most part, maybe those are, like, okay. But the things that, like, really mess me up are something like a bat, where when you hit them, they'll bounce back up, but they'll move left or right, depending right. on which area they're facing. Um, and then there's the zombies, where when they're coming down the note highway, they come down diagonally. And I, mm-hmm. I can't read that. There, It's also possible for, like, you know, there's uh, these harpies, which move two spaces at a time. There's uh, blade masters, which... They'll move down the highway and then they will unsheath their sword and then immediately jump down to the hit area. So I, I really don't like I really yeah, don't like that. The, just reading this game is such a headache for me, and I wish it wasn't like this because I I aesthetically really like this game. It, the theming is like very, very good. I think the like the whole package is very, very good. Oh, Jaren also they can also be offbeat, which you know <laughs> No, no, I don't, no. don't want to do it. But that I was really looking forward to it. But again, I'm looking for a more casual rhythm experience, and this is too abstract for me to really but sink my teeth into. Where I'll try the demo, but I'm mm-hmm. most likely waiting for the Hatsune Miku DLC. Yeah, like I think. My, yeah, I I wish I liked this game because yeah. I wish they innovated, or I guess more so I wish they innovated in a different way, because for me, I think like you said, this is more reactionary than reading a a note chart, and mm-hmm. I think reading a note chart is so ingrained into my head that yeah, having to change to this is just, I don't know, it's just like not happening. It's like trying to throw with my left hand sort of thing, and I don't want to go go through that experience. Where, again, I'm glad that they are, you know, innovating Mm -hmm. your standard note highway. But at the same time, it's, I'm, as you said, like you, that's ingrained in me. Like, I like being able to sight read Mm -hmm. note charts. And if I need to think of, man, I'm already trying to think of, am I going to hit this on beat? Where I can't Uh think of actually dealing with mechanics at the same time Mm -hmm. where Mm -hmm. um definitely something i'll keep an eye out but maybe not something i'll get right away just because or something that will take a lot more practice but Mm -hmm. matt Mm -hmm. that sounds like another fulfilling steam next fest uh we got to check out some really cool demos yes Uh, looking forward to the full releases for many of them and hoping that the ones we were interested that aren't fully there, they're demos after all, subject mm-hmm. to change, and hopefully they get where they need to be. But mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. there's only one way to end this Beefy Boy episode, mm-hmm. and that's a don't match me challenge. Yeah. Because Matt, mm-hmm. we got to take things full circle here. And you know, just to recap for all our friends out there, the don't match me challenge goes like this. We're going to give you five rounds of uh, particular topics, particular categories, and your job is to think of an answer that doesn't match my answer because I'll be providing uh, the situations this week. And if you want to do something really hard, uh, try not to match Matt as well, where, because we this is an audio journal for us, uh, if you don't know an answer, you know, simply pause, find one, and unpause and see if your findings differ than mine but matt Mm -hmm. to take it back top of the show no real need to uh pause and find something here because matt Mm -hmm. let's see how this bingo ball (laughs) uh random picker goes because matt mm -hmm. don't match me challenge this week 
five rounds, five letters in bingo. Uh, all you have to do is not match whatever this RNG bingo picker picks out for each letter. Easy Ooh. enough. So Matt, mm-hmm. I'm looking at a standard bingo card. Yes. And for round one of Don't Match Me, uh, name a B number. So that's a B one to 15 and don't mm. match what this random picker chooses. So yeah. think of a B number between one and 15 in five, four, three, two, one. Madden friends, if you chose B seven, you're out. Oh man, Jaren, I was I was really close there, but I decided to go with the. I believe B twelve is a vitamin. <laughs> we can always use some B twelve, some vitamin B, Matt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Matt, mm-hmm. I spy with my eye <laughs> AI number. Ooh. Matt, mm-hmm. I on a standard card goes from sixteen to thirty. So Matt, this might be easy mode, but this might be hard mode as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so pick a number between. I 16 and 30 in five, four, three, two, one. Matt and friends, if you said I 23, oh. you're out. <laughs> oh, man, Jared. I went with uh, I 21. <laughs> Matt, they're getting close. They're getting close. They're close. They're close. They're close. So, Matt, mm-hmm. I'm not going to pick the free st- uh, spot here, but mm-hmm. for N. N goes from 31 to 45. So, mm-hmm. Matt and friends, pick a number between N31 and 45 in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. If you chose N31, you're out. Jared, I went with N42. <laughs> Good pick, Matt. Good pick. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Matt, mm-hmm. gotta go with the G's. Mm-hmm. Gotta go with the G's. 46 to 60. Just have to pick a number between there in five, four, three, two, one. If you picked a G, 58, you're out. Ooh, Jared, I went with G47. Okay. Matt, you're getting farther. You're getting mm-hmm. farther. Mm-hmm. Pretty safe. Pretty mm-hmm. safe. Okay, Matt. Matt, mm-hmm. I'm a child <laughs> because. You'll know where this is going. <laughs> you know where I'm going to. <laughs> Matt O spans from 61 to 75. And uh-huh. Matt, uh-huh. every time a particular number was called, I went <laughs> nice. nice. So Matt nice. and uh-huh. friends, uh-huh. pick a number between 0, 061 and 75 in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Matt? Uh-huh. I know what you picked, <laughs> but if our friends picked O, 71, ooh, they're out. Ooh, ooh, Jared, you know what I picked. I feel like I don't need to say because it's a pretty nice O. <laughs> it's a nice O, Matt. It's a nice O. Matt, mm-hmm. pretty easy going. Uh, don't match me just to end a beefy boy week. Mm-hmm. Uh, Matt, they all can't be super hard, but then, you know, so, sometimes you want to leave it up to chance, just like your dice one mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. a few months back. But Matt, mm-hmm. this has been the Mistake Zone for the week. Another beefy episode. So got to thank you, as always, for joining me this week and editing this podcast. Yo, thanks, Jaren. As always, I want to thank you for hosting this episode, bringing us our Don't Match Me and... You know, recommending me to go play Bloodshed, because I actually did really enjoy uh, playing through that, even though we had our, our gripes with it. But it comes out of love, Matt, because mm-hmm. I, I do want this game to, you know, find... A, a, okay, like, I don't want to say make this game for me, per se, but I would hope that the devs find success. But hopefully, uh, it's that path to success is something that I'm more aligned with. But again, Mm -hmm. hopefully it gets there, like a lot of the games we played. So I want to thank all the Steam Next Fest demos that we played this week. Matt, Mm -hmm. I want to thank O69 for being a pretty (laughs) nice number. Nice. Nice. Mm -hmm. I want to thank, uh, I want to thank Coke Freestyle Machines because that theater we went to had a Coke Freestyle machine. So as much as it hurt to buy a drink, Matt, Mm-hmm. One, one more story before we leave mm-hmm. you know me we need to get the most out of our coke freestyle drinks yes and you know we got one at the beginning of the movie uh partner had to leave to go uh 
I'll be honest, she was kind of bored, so she got up <laughs> to get a refill. Uh-huh. And Matt, uh-huh. we wanted to take one for the road, but unfortunately the movie ended when the theater closed, and Matt uh, turned off the machines. Damn. Felt damn. real bad. <laughs> Need to see it. Need felt see real it. bad. But, Matt, mm-hmm. uh, please, take it away. This has been a Mistake Zone, and we're all out of this quarter's next fest. Until next fest time, Matt. <laughs>